Welcome back to another episode of Code Deconstructed. I'm really excited about today's episode because we'll be looking at something that until now hasn't had a lot of information available on it, and that's functional reactive programming. This also marks the first episode where we're going to be looking at a game, and not just any game. This is a 3D game written using OpenGL. And I'll talk about it a little bit more, but while I'm talking, we might as well check out the code here from GitHub, like usual. And the program's name is Cuboid. So what's interesting about this is that it's surprisingly hard to find a complete example of functional reactive programming. You can find a lot of toy examples out there, and you may qualify Cuboid as a toy example um, as well, considering its size. Which, now that I've brought that up, why don't we take a look at that? And you can see that it weighs in at just about, um, actually, less than 300 lines of code. In order for you to follow along, I usually check out a tag, but since none exist on the repository, we'll just use a or rather the latest hash. And to get that, let's take a look at get log. And the latest was from August 2010. So we should be able to just list enough of this hash to uh, make it unambiguous. So if you want to follow along, that's the hash I'm working with. As usual, I'm going to use uh, Cabal Dev to build this. And rather than play some piano music for you, let's uh, actually start taking a look at the code while it's building. So everything is in the top level directory, and we can start by looking at main. And I'm just going to kind of skim the code here. Let's take a look at update. And if you're familiar with Haskell, a lot of this may actually be unfamiliar to you. Let's look at graphics. Graphics has a lot of OpenGL code. So the episode is labeled Haskell, and we are working with Haskell, but really we're working with a couple languages that have been embedded in Haskell. In this case, OpenGL and Yampa. So just staring at this code isn't going to do much for us until we see what the program is actually supposed to do. And the program is a game. It's a 3D puzzle game. And using the W and D keys, we can rotate this cube. And then the red sphere is the player, or us. And Let's try that again. The controls are a little bit strange. Uh, you have to factor in the uh, rotation of the cube. Uh, but there we go, we've, we've reached the goal. This level is actually a little bit easier. And then the third level is a bit of a challenge. Not even sure it has a solution, actually. And the thing that really struck me about this program is that if you have worked with OpenGL game or you know graphics programming before, 250 lines of code may be just enough to set up the scene. And getting an entire game into 250 lines of code is pretty impressive. Rather than take apart this program in a way that probably won't make much sense, let's first construct a simpler one so that we can grasp the basic concepts first and then we'll revisit this game. I came across a simple example of modeling something with functional reactive programming in Hendrik Nielsen's lecture notes or slides on FRP. There's a diagram from his second lecture, slide 104, that shows how to model a bouncing ball. 
And it says that if we have a ball suspended at some height y0 with a velocity of v0, there are two equations which determine its velocity as it falls and its height as it falls. And those are here, y equals y0 plus the integral of v dt, and v equals v0 plus the integral of negative 9.81, which you might recognize as the acceleration of an object due to gravity on Earth in meters per second squared. If you haven't studied calculus or physics, don't worry, this will become clear as we implement it in code. There's also a note about what happens to the velocity when it hits the ground with a fully elastic collision, but we're going to wait on that for a little bit and just model the fall for now. So the first thing we'll do is make a new Cabal project called Bounce and just create a basic Cabal file so that we can add the Yampa and OpenGL libraries easily. Like usual, nothing really matters here except for choosing executable. And then let's edit the Cabal file. We'll add Yampa as a dependency. Set the main to main.hs. Uh, before I forget, let's create a fake license file. And then just start stubbing out the program like any other Haskell program. And for now, we're just going to leave a main empty. Let's import uh, FRP Yampa. And we'll go ahead and implement a signal function for modeling how the ball falls. I'm going to go ahead and start by borrowing some types from Nielsen's lecture notes. The position of the ball is going to be represented by a double and the velocity as well. Then the signal function itself, falling ball, uh, Yampa defines SF as a signal function that takes an input and produces an output. For this example we're not going to have any input but the output of this signal function is going to be the new position of the ball and the new velocity of the ball. We also need to take as input to the function the initial position of the ball, or the height that it was dropped at. And this might be a little bit confusing because the signal function has an input, and the function that returns the signal function also has an input. But I think that'll be clear uh, once we implement it. So falling ball takes a position. And now the signal function needs to be implemented as an arrow. If you haven't seen or worked with arrows before, they're a bit like monads. But rather than get into the theory of them, let's just go ahead and write some code. First, instead of producing a signal function that actually models the falling ball, we'll just have one that returns a constant value uh, for simplicity. So we'll use uh, the constant position and a constant velocity of zero. This triple ampersand operator here combines these two arrows into an output that is a pair, just like we need here, a pair of position and velocity. So let's see if we can load this into GHCI with Cabal Dev. Let's run Cabal Dev install first, and try that again. And in order to get at the functions that we haven't exported, we'll load main interpreted. And now to test our signal function, Yampa provides a function called embed. You can see that its first argument is a signal function. The second is a little bit strange, and it produces a list of results. The List of results type here matches the output type of the signal function. So let's try this with our signal function falling ball. But remember that falling ball took an argument, the initial height, which we'll just set to 10 meters. 
Then we give it a list and the input to our signal function was nothing. And now we give it a list of, you can think of them as intervals with possible inputs. This may not make sense yet, but let's start by going uh, one second, another one second, and another one second, and see what happens to the ball, which in this case, it should just stay suspended at 10 meters. And that's exactly the result we've got here. So we have a list of four values that if we look at our signal function is the position and velocity of the ball. This first value is at the starting time of zero. The second is one second further, another second further, and then another second further. Now what I find interesting about functional reactive programming is that we're dealing with time, but we haven't mentioned it here anywhere in our signal function or anywhere in the program for that matter. We've passed a list of times in with embed, but that's just a way of testing the signal function. And this is about where the integrals that you saw from that slide come into play. So now instead of using a constant velocity of zero, let's use negative 9.81. But the velocity isn't going to just jump straight to nine, negative 9.81. It's going to be the integral of negative 9.81. You might recall from studying calculus that the integral determines the area underneath a curve. So you could picture a graph of the line at negative 9.81. And once we've moved to a second, the area underneath it will be negative 9.81 and each second that will increase by another negative 9.81. And we should be able to see that in GHCI with our example. This time, the position still hasn't changed, but the velocity is accelerating every second. And what's interesting is we can change these values to look at what happens at, say, half a second, and you can see that the signal function isn't dependent on any discrete time intervals. We're not running it every tenth of a second or every second. Yampa is actually taking care of dealing with the dt in this equation and calculating the integral for us. So we have the velocity of the ball, but we still haven't used that velocity to determine the position of the ball. To do that, we need to feed this velocity into the arrow that calculates the position. And the equation tells us that we need to take the integral of the velocity, but we also need to add that to the initial position. And let's call that position y0 just to match the diagram that we have. So we'll add it. This operator here allows us to use a pure function instead of a signal function or arrow, which integral and constant are. But we're still not done yet because this only returns a position. What we need is a pair of the position and the velocity. And the way to do that is the operator we were using earlier, the, the triple ampersand. And what it does is takes the input to this arrow and duplicates it between these two arrows here. We didn't have to worry about that earlier because there's no input to this signal function. But in this case, we now have the new velocity coming in. We take that velocity to calculate the position in the first part of this arrow. And then we just take the identity of that velocity to return the second part of our output in the pair. So let's save that and try that again with embed. And by the time we've gotten to three seconds, the ball has gone through the floor because we don't, because we haven't actually implemented the elastic collision yet at position zero. Now, I want to show you one more thing before we go for this episode, and that is the reactimate loop.
Reactimate is provided by Yamba to sort of provide an event loop or game loop or whatever you want to think of it as. It takes an initialization function, an input function, an output function, and then the main signal function. In this case, it's going to be falling ball at position 10 meters. The initialization function we don't need to do anything with. The input function we'll look at in a minute. And the output function is going to receive the output of the signal function so that we can do something with it, such as draw it on the screen with OpenGL, or for now, just print it to the console. But we don't just get the output, we get the output and a Boolean value first, which we're going to ignore for now. So we'll just write out um, the position and the velocity. And we have to return false from this. I can't remember why right now, but it, it doesn't matter. And for the input function, what we need to provide is a list of times and events similar to what you saw with embed. I'm just gonna format this a little bit to make it a little easier to read and see what's going on here. Let's see. And as with the output function, we receive an argument we don't care about. And we're going to return uh, intervals in tenths of a second with no event on them. But we don't want to just return these in rapid succession. Uh, let's actually delay for a tenth of a second first. Actually, we don't need do here. And so for thread delay, we'll need Control concurrent, and let's see if this compiles. And now let's test this, and I'm going to be need, need to be ready to hit Control C. Oops, a little bit premature there. And so you can see the ball falling through time here. But it's a little bit boring to just look at values printed to the console. And I told you at the beginning of this that we'd be looking at OpenGL and the game. And so what I'd like to do next is take these values and visualize the path of the ball falling in OpenGL. But that's going to have to wait for the next episode. Here's a little teaser of what it's going to look like to start with using the code from Cuboid. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next episode where we're going to build on these fundamentals and you'll start to see the concise, expressive power of functional reactive programming. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.